Okay, everybody, well, welcome again to Reasons for Faith number three for this year. Um, just a reminder that next month we have Professor Neil Broom coming to, to visit us, and he's doing a talk on life's X Factor, the missing link in materialism's science of living things. So that should be fairly stretchy for the intellect. Um, just a reminder that over here we have a list of resources if you want, uh, books and articles, YouTube channels, uh, websites, that sort of thing, which can help in the uh, whole process of getting to grips with some of these subjects, can add to what some of the speakers are saying. Um, remember our own YouTube channel, just go to YouTube and type Reasons for Faith and you can see all the videos of the past sessions. Um, uh, also, there's an email sign up back there if you want to sign up and get um, notifications of meetings and uh, times, that sort of thing. Uh, I certainly won't be spamming you with anything. Um, also, a gold coin donation, uh, just to mention that. Uh, so today we're happy to have Professor David Richmond again. Um, very nice of him to give us his time. Last September he did a, uh, a talk on how do we know the Bible is reliable. And I listened to that again the other day and it's actually excellent stuff in that. So go on YouTube and listen to that one. Um, David is an emeritus professor at Auckland University. Uh, founder and chairman of the Hope Foundation for research on ageing, and he does a lot of uh, political um, talking, I suppose, on euthanasia, on the subject of euthanasia, so that may be a topic we could do at some stage as well. So, welcome David to today's meeting, and he's going to be talking on, is hell real, is hell eternal? Thank you, David. Good, thanks, Andrew. Well, it's nice to be here again, and uh, see so many people coming out on such a rough afternoon. I suppose maybe you thought if you came here and discussed hell, you might get a bit warmer. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so today we're going to, uh, we're going to travel on some contentious grounds today. Um, there will be stuff here that um, you might react quite violently against, and there might be other stuff that you'll react sympathetically to. But, uh, in a situation like this, I think it's always worthwhile listening to what is being said and, uh, and maybe getting hold of some other uh, resources uh, just to chew it over so that um, we don't sort of have um, uh, rapid um, responses that uh, put up barriers. So there you go. Don't, don't say you haven't been warned. Okay, so we're talking about the problem of eternal conscious punishment in hell. And the uh, subtitle of this lecture here, Beasts and Super Beasts Feel the Heat, uh, will become uh, relevant in a short time. But it, it's actually a play on the name of a 1940 book by a person called Saki, S-A-K-I, which was a pseudonym for Howard Henry Munro. And his book of short stories was one of the late Reverend John Stott's favourite pieces of fiction. Now, I'm sure most of you would have heard of the Reverend John Stott. Uh, who was uh, for a long time rector of um, All, All Souls uh, in London, and a uh, very famous um, uh, pastor, preacher, teacher, and uh, founder of the Langham Institute, which uh, now uh, has um, uh, centres all over the world where they help local national pastors uh, to learn preaching techniques. Uh, they help them with their literature, and uh, they... Um, Provide um, provide books and libraries and so on for them. So they're very. It's become a really very uh, influential group. And John Stott was just a wonderful man in his time. I heard him only preach once, unfortunately, uh, because by the time we got to London, um, he was beginning to move out of uh, All Souls and starting to do more stuff around the world. Okay, now um, the proposition is this. But no, we, we start with this proposition because we commonly hear this sort of stuff from critics of the Christian faith. How can any thinking person believe on the one hand that God is a God of love and the creator of humanity and on the other that he's fully prepared to consign those of his creatures who aren't saved to eternal torment in the fires of hell? 
Where's the justice in that? Where's the proportionality between crime and punishment? It seems that human beings have more protection under the law in this world than they can expect in the world to come. Now that question is not just confined to non-Christians. It's echoed from time to time uh, by the church and by, uh, by, uh, by pastors, preachers, even theological professors. And in fact, it's the theological stumbling block which has spawned the emergent church movement uh, with its slide towards universalism and syncretism. So there's an increasing consensus amongst evangelical theologians that the doctrine of hell um, as being a place of eternal torment by unquenchable, unquenchable fire is biblically unsound. It's not a new idea because Martin Luther actually didn't believe in it. Uh, the late John Stott certainly didn't support it. Um, and it's been observed in recent years that even fundamentalist preachers don't preach very much about the subject. Now, in attacking this uh, subject, we need to ask two important questions. The first one is, what are the presuppositions, that is, the ideas that we hold as givens, that we bring to the table? So what are the, what, what's the basis, really, for, our, for our, um, our, our, our beliefs in any situation? What are the presuppositions? And are those presuppositions supported by Scripture? Now, the moral justification for the deeply held orthodox conviction that sinners will be punished by eternal conscious torment in hell is ultimately to be found in the presupposition that the soul is inherently immortal. And so if the soul is immortal and created to be so by God himself, then it's clearly not possible that the soul could ever be destroyed. It has to exist forever. And just as there is no end to eternal life in the heavens for a soul like that, there could never be uh, any end to suffering in hell. If, on the other hand, one's presupposition is the soul is not inherently immortal, then its destruction becomes a possibility, and hell begins to look a little bit different. So the thesis I'm putting forward is based on these things here. First of all, and this is not, I must say, this is not um, original to me. Uh, this is... This is well recognized through the theological world now. But the concept of a soul or a spirit as an entity separate from the body is mistaken. Secondly, the biblical understanding of the soul is that it is not inherently immortal. Thirdly, that immortality will only be conferred after the resurrection, limited to those who are received into God's kingdom. So what we're saying here is that the soul is not inherently immortal, but that immortality will be given to it given to those who are belonging to Christ at the resurrection. Fourthly, that between our physical death and the resurrection, we are in what some term an intermediate state, which in some places in Scripture is likened to sleep. We'll come back to that in a minute. And uh, finally, that hell exists, but it's a place of rapid destruction, not of lingering torment. Now, that many, many people will experience eternal punishment is undisputed by most conservative theological scholars. Jesus, in speaking of his return and the resurrection, speaks of two categories of people, the sheep and the goats at the Day of Judgment, Matthew 25. The sheep representing the righteous are sent off to eternal life, the goats representing the unrighteous to eternal punishment. Although this, the discrimination between the two is apparently on the basis of how they treated their neighbours, the righteous, you will note, actually receive an inheritance. That is, their good works are evidence of a life of faith worked out in love, since an inheritance is not earned. This is probably the same judgment at the end of time as depicted in Revelation 20, and we'll come back to that too. Now, the traditional Protestant view of hell is that at death there is some kind of a triage system. We, we call it a triage system in medicine, uh, a situation where you, you make decisions about who's going to be treated and who's not. So, for example, perhaps you have a major bus accident and there are 30 people all in need of care and you've only got two doctors and, and a nurse. You have to decide which of those people are likely to be salvageable and which are not and, and throw most of your uh, e efforts towards those who are salvageable. So we call it a triage system. So effectively, what we're saying is that pro the Protestant view of hell is that and when you die, there's some kind of a triage system, effectively a first judgment, that consigns the righteous or some disembodied immortal part of them, usually referred to as the soul or spirit, to heaven, 
and the unrepentant to hell. And according to this scenario, hell is burning right now. Now no one seems to be sure how the selection system works or who's responsible for it, although St. Peter is commonly uh, felt to have some function. <clears throat> now to give eschatology or end times a light run over, scholars predict, oh, oh sorry, here we are. This is, this is the way, this is the common way in which uh, Protestants think about, about death and, uh, and the soul. So we have the body, we, you die, and then the good soul goes to heaven, the bad soul goes to hell, the body um, stays in the ground, and then you have the resurrection, um, which obviously those in heaven don't sort of need to be resurrected, but there'll be people still in this state here will need to be. Um, and then there's the judgment, and then the good souls go back to heaven, I suppose, where they came from, and the old ones, the, the bad ones go to hell, and that's where eternity comes in, and these ones are in heaven for eternal eternity, and these ones are in hell for eternity. They're experiencing good times, and these ones are experiencing bad times. So good times and bad times. Now just to, to give um, uh, a, a little bit of background to this, uh, most, uh, many, many uh, conservative uh, evangelicals predict that there are three, four, or five major interventions that may affect the church in the end times. First of all, some predict that there is an early resurrection of the righteous, which is sometimes called the rapture, although that's not a biblical term. And that, uh, that happens before the great tribulation, which we'll come to in a minute. And it, it brings the church uh, out of the terrors and trials and troubles of that terrible tribulation time. So it saves the church those who are Christians, who are committed Christians, they come out of the ground and they all go to be with the Lord in the rapture. Now some predict then that there's going to be this great tribulation, a time when Satan will be allowed to harass the church. And these predictions are made on the basis of certain ways that people read books like the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Um, and some predict a millennium, which is a period of a thousand years during which Christ will temporarily rule the earth and which may or may not occur before the final resurrection, because there is certainly going to be the final resurrection. That's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. And the war to end all wars uh, between the forces of the Lamb, of God, and of the devil, and that's sometimes associated with Armageddon. Now speculation as to the reality and the timing of these events and their relationships one with another uh, is contentious. For example, some believe the rapture will occur before the tribulation and others think it happens afterwards. Some don't think it happens at all. Some predict the final resurrection will occur before and others after the millennium. Uh, and these issues can be tremendously um, divisive. And um, I have an interesting story to tell you and I've left it at home unfortunately, but it's about a, a chap who was walking over the Golden Gate Bridge on a Sunday morning going to church. And um, uh, he stopped, it was just such a beautiful morning, and he stopped beside another chap. Uh, they were both looking at it, and the other fellow said to him, the Creator did a good job, didn't he? And the first fellow said, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. Oh, he said, so am I. And he slapped him on the back. Great. And, uh, and then he said, you Protestant or, or Catholic? Oh, he said, I'm Protestant. Ah, so am I. He said, wonderful, wonderful to meet another Protestant. He said, um, have you been baptized? Oh, yes, yes, I've been baptized. Praise the Lord, he says. How, how were you baptized? By immersion. It's the only way. Yes, he said, that's right. I'm a Baptist too. I, we were baptized by immersion. And then he says, um, uh, what's your position um, on, the, uh, on the, the rapture? He said, is it going to be before or after the, uh, the Great Tribulation? Oh, he said, it's going to be before. Yes, I believe that too. He said, good on you, brother. And, and then he says, um, what's your position um, on, the, uh, on the millennium? He said, is the... Um, is Christ going to come before or after the millennium? Oh no, he says it's going to be coming. He's going to be coming uh, after the millennium. And uh, this first fellow said, "How could you believe a doctrine like that?" He said, "You're just a scum." And he picks this fellow up by the seat of his pants and he tries to throw him over the bridge. But the other fellow's stronger than him, and so he gets thrown over the bridge and down to the waters. And there he meets St. Peter. And St. Peter says, "How did you come to get here?" And he said, it's a long story. 
Yeah. Okay. So, now whether we believe about all these other, whatever we believe about these other events, there's general agreement on the doctrine of a resurrection of the dead, following which each person is judged on the basis of whether they have accepted or rejected God's offer of salvation. So that will determine whether they will be consigned irrespectively to heaven and eternal life or to hell. And today we're focusing on hell. I'm not going to say anything about the Catholic position because theirs is a bit different. Um, so we will move on a little bit. Now the concept of a fiery eternal hell has fired up the imagination of, uh, of many uh, hellfire uh, preachers over the centuries to describe the most sickening effects um, of the um, uh, of eternal planet, uh, of hellfire. That's right. And there are stories really of uh, American evangelists who preach about um, holding children over the flames. You know, um, or holding people over the flames, and they'll feel the, the fierce fires of hell coming up, and and they'll be screaming. And they, they, some of those American evangelists of the, of the uh, two centuries ago were very good at creating these pictures of people suffering in hell. And um, uh, the um, that sort of picture is nowhere found in the Bible, so it was their imagination. But they were really scaring people. Into the uh, into the Christian faith. Now, several of the early church fathers, Justin Martyr was one, taught that the soul was mortal. But they were up against a powerful force in the church in the second century that was attempting to demonstrate that Christian practice and thought were compatible with Hellenistic beliefs. Persecution and ridicule of the Christian community were rife at that time. Their doctrine of resurrection was scoffed at. The Christian apologists thought to circumvent that by demonstrating the compatibility of Christian and Greek thought. Greek philosophy was still largely based on Plato's ideas, although he had been dead for 400 years. He believed in an immortal soul, an invisible, immaterial entity separate from the material, visible, and mortal body. So he believed that, that a person was created, uh, was made up of these two bits, the mortal, visible body, the immortal, immaterial soul or mind, Mind and soul seem to be sort of um, together there. Uh, in fact, Plato seems to have believed in a form of reincarnation, but that was close enough to resurrection for the apologists. So the doctrine gradually infiltrated the church, although you will not find it mentioned as a core doctrine in the early creeds, such as the Apostles' Creed of AD 180 or the Creed of Nicaea at AD 325. But a number of scripture verses are sufficiently ambiguous to allow the possibility of the Platonic concept, or something like it, to be ratified as being biblical if you don't read them very carefully. Now the alternative view to that, that there is a, a mortal soul in a, in a person, is that the term soul means the whole person. Now Genesis 2 verse 7 states that God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He became a living soul. In other words, the breath of God plus the body equals the soul. Uh, and in support of this view, the words, words translated as soul, and there are two um, uh, words, nephesh and suki, which are often translated as soul, they often just mean me. Uh, for example, in Psalm 7 5, where nephesh is translated my life, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of that in the scripture. Now, the soul, that is me, um, in, in this view, is not inherently immortal, but is subject to death. Uh, for example, Ezekiel 18, uh, 4 and verse 20 reads, The soul who sins will surely die. And John three sixteen itself said, Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the idea that the soul would actually per will perish, or the person will perish, um, is quite consistent with, with many, many scriptures. So according to this view, and this is, I'll tell you what, once over lightly, there is no problem with an everlasting hell trying to cope with immortal sinners. Immortality is a gift from God at the resurrection, and the condition that we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And that view is often called conditional immortality, because immortality is conditional on us being, uh, having faith in Jesus Christ and being received by him uh, at the judgment. Into, in, received by him into heaven. 
Now, we're not going to take any more about those aspects of, of it for the time being because that's really a whole different study, and I want to concentrate on hell. So, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is perhaps the most cited piece of evidence supporting the concept of eternal conscious punishment. And unless one looks at it closely, one might indeed get the impression that Jesus was here teaching something substantive about the nature of hell. If you accept that that is what Jesus was doing, then this is what you'll learn about hell. First of all, one's financial and social status is a powerful determinant of one's eligibility for heaven or hell. Remember, the rich man went to hell, the poor man went to heaven. Now Jesus doesn't say that, morally speaking, Lazarus was any better than the rich man, or that Lazarus was a believer, and the rich man wasn't. But that's one of the things you will learn from the story. If you believe that Jesus is really teaching factual stuff about hell, that's one of the things you have to realise, he's teaching. Second thing he would, you, would, you would learn is that those in hell are able to see and communicate with those in paradise, and that the latter are aware of the distress of the former forever and ever. And this is surely at odds with Revelation 21.4, which where we read, there will be no more crying or pain. But uh, as we know from the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there is that uh, interchange between people in paradise and people in hell. Another thing we might learn is that those in hell are not particularly keen to leave it, although they are uncomfortable enough to wish that others might not join them there. You remember the rich man didn't plead with Abraham to exercise his influence to have him released from hell, and he certainly didn't confess to any wrongdoing during his life, including treating Lazarus badly, or repent in the hope of escaping. So he was quite happy there, although he didn't want other people to come. Maybe he was getting bored. Another thing we might learn, this sounds a bit trivial, but nevertheless, um, a, a finger dipped in cold water and placed on the tongue of an inhabitant of hell is able to significantly reduce the discomfort because that's what he asked, wasn't it? That, that uh, Abraham come and dip a finger in cold water and put it on his tongue. Well, to me, that doesn't sound like an antidote to a lake of burning sulfur. So those are the sort of things that you'll learn, and, and also you'll learn this, that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment. So then we have to ask yourself, what actually is Jesus trying to get at here in this paragraph? The point of the paragraph is none of these things. It's surely to emphasise the fact that in the case of people who have hardened their hearts to the teachings of Scripture, even the fact of Jesus' death and resurrection is not likely to turn them from rebellion to repentance and belief in God's way of salvation. And you remember that Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And we know that's absolutely true. The religious leaders of Jesus' time uh, were not convinced when he rose from the dead, and it's still true today. People are not convinced when, uh, <coughs> that, that uh, Jesus is God, even though the, uh, the resurrection, there is, there's, a, there's a huge historical um, uh, uh, back up for the, for the uh, facts of, the, of, the, of Jesus' resurrection. So that's what Jesus is trying to tell from the story. None of, this, none of these other things. Now, yes, there we are. Sorry, I missed the slide there. <coughs> now, we want to talk about beasts and super beasts because there are graphic images of hell in the book of Revelation and they are also commonly appealed to as a description of the eternal torment in hell of the ungodly by those who interpret the book of Revelation literally. The two major references are Revelation 14, 9 to 18 and 27 to 15. I'll return to those verses a bit later because as we shall discover, Revelation 14, verse 11 is the only verse in the whole Bible from which a case for eternal conscious punishment in a fiery hell could credibly be argued. Now, from chapter 11, the book of Revelation depicts a strange melange of interacting humans, humanoids, non-humans, and celestial beings. The humans are a woman who is pregnant and gives birth in chapter 12, a prostitute, chapter 17, and a false prophet, chapter 16. The humanoids are two men, in quotes, designated witnesses in chapter 11. I call them humanoids 
because they have characteristics of men, olive trees, and lampstands. Could they be robots? Could be. Then there are nine major non-human players fronting up for evil in rebellion against God. They are, in order of appearance on the stage, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. This dragon and his angels make war against Michael and his angels. They are defeated, and he's tossed out of heaven to the earth. Then there's the first beast that comes up out of the sea. In appearance, it's a leopard with bear's feet and a lion's mouth. It's got seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns covered with blasphemous names. And you read about him in Revelation 12 and 13. Then there's a second beast, and this one comes out of the earth. And, and in appearance, it's got two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon, and it performs great miracles, forcing people to worship the first beast, which was that big red dragon, and make a statue of it. I beg your pardon, forcing the people to worship the, the, the beast that came out of the, out of the earth, the lamb-like beast. And this beast, I believe, is Satan's alternate for the Lamb of God. Now the statue of that first beast comes alive by the power of the second beast and forces people to worship it on pain of death. And that's it sitting up there on its altar. Quite fascinating, all these beasts. Then there's a false prophet, who is, it turns out, an alternate manifestation of the second beast. Now clues to this include his number, 666, which is said to be the number of man, uh, that once he appears on the scene, the second beast is sighted no more, and that in 19 verse 20, it is he who is credited with having performed the miraculous signs on behalf of the beast and deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, all actions previously attributed to the second beast. And then there are three evil spirits like frogs, which I didn't have enough imagination to draw, uh, covered with, uh, yes, they are spewed up by the dragon, a false prophet, and one of the first two beasts. They are, they are responsible for gathering the kings of the earth and their armies to Armageddon for the second last battle between the forces of evil and the forces of Almighty God. And then there's another scarlet beast <coughs> with seven heads and ten horns like the first one, covered with blasphemous names, but it doesn't have crowns on its head, whereas the first one, the big red dragon, did. Now it isn't totally clear if this is another beast or the first beast in drag or, Sa or, or Satan, the scarlet dragon. The evidence favouring Satan is that this scarlet beast seems to be visible and invisible periodically. It says in me, once was, now is, not, and will come. Apparently having done time in the abyss, which is, which is the schedule we learn later that awaits Satan. Whatever, its ultimate fate is said to be destruction. Chapter 17, verse 11. This scarlet beast and his mates plot to make war against the Lamb of God. Now we learn that there is a large allegorical component to these beasts. For example, the dragon's heads represent hills and kings as do the crowns. And that is commented, that's commentary uh, by, uh, by John in uh, Revelation 17 verses 9 to 14. It seems that what is being pictured here are coalitions of kingdoms and nations infused with satanic evil and united in one thing. Rebellion against Almighty God and the Lamb of God. Then there are celestial beings, <clears throat> and they are the Lamb of God, a variety of angels, and God Almighty Himself. Now, eventually, the first and second beast, that's the false prophet, make war on God's army, presumably at Armageddon, are defeated, captured, and thrown into the lake of fire which in chapter 20, verse 14, is said to be the second death. However, we note that the humans who fought with them against God were killed, according to chapter 19, verse 21, and they were not thrown into the lake fire. And that's because this was their first death. But what of Satan? It turns out that, um, that Satan and, and the dragon are one and the same. He's lurking around because he is captured after this battle and consigned to the pit, the abyss that we were talking about, apparently which is not hell itself but some other underground place, for a thousand years. 
And that's where the idea of the millennium largely comes from, that there'll be a thousand years of peace without Satan around because somehow he's confined to the, to the nether of the places. But having served his time incarcerated in the abyss, in the abyss, he's freed on probation. I'm getting... Yes, here we are, that's the one we're looking at there. Right, he's freed on probation, but his hatred of God still seething, he tears off to wreck more mayhem, treacherously pulling together an army in number like the sand of the sea. He surrounds God's army, but his human army and supporters are consumed with fire from heaven. And he is captured again and carted off to join his old mates, the beast of the false prophet, in the lake of burning sulfur, where they are said to be tormented day and night forever and ever, in Revelation 19, 7 to 21. The last act is the judgment of the living and the dead. According to Revelation 20, verse 15 and 21, 8, the lake of burning sulfur awaits sinners and anyone whose name does not appear in the book of life. This fate is said to be the second death. Specifically, it does not say that they will be tormented forever and ever. Now, this interesting scenario leaves more questions than answers. What happens to the other rat bags, the statue that came alive, the frog-like evil spirits who were said to be uh, spirits of demons working miracles, and the second scale of beast? It all remains a mystery. Why weren't they dealt to? They just fade from the scene. In the end, the only beings who are specifically said to suffer eternal torment in the lake of flaming sulfur are Satan, a.k.a. the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast, a.k.a. the false prophet. But how could a non-material demonic being like Satan, or for that matter the beast, be tormented forever by physical material fire? Even more startling, the last entities to be pitched into the lake of fire, the... Um, uh, are, hell, are death and hell themselves. Now death is not a material combustible substance and for that matter Paul speaks of death being the last enemy to be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15. So death doesn't suffer eternal torment in the fire. And as for hell, how can hell be thrown into hell? Doesn't work. So it seems to me that the point of these nightmarish events is to signal the end of this whole sorry scene. The end of the second death and the end of hell. In my opinion, whether one takes the Revelation story literally or figuratively, for example, the harlot is often identified with Rome, it is all too allegorical, allegorical to safely build a self-solid doctrine. Oh, what's going wrong with me? It's too allegorical to safely build a solid doctrine of eternal conscious torment in hell around, especially in the light of all the other teaching in Scripture that fails to support the concept, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, what about the scenario in chapter 14 that we've skipped over? Surely it's quite specific in its support for an eternal conscious punishment for the ungodly. I don't have a Bible. Does anyone have a scripture here at all? <laughs> yeah, just, I just have that I'll just read a few verses from... Okay. Well, we're, 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 yes, Revelation. Yeah, Revelation 14, 9 to 12. Would you like to read it? Revelation 14, 9 to 12. a third one followed him saying with a loud voice if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day and night those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name here is, the here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, a blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours for their deeds follow with them. Now that, that, that passage is, is, uh, is often taken to, uh, to show uh, unequivocally that there is eternal conscious punishment in hell. But let's have a, a closer look at it. First of all, it's a warning. The tense is actually future. 
And we know that God is merciful and does not always carry out his threats. The fate of the city of Nineveh after Jonah's preaching to her is an example. In 40 days the city will be destroyed, but it wasn't. However, it could be argued in that case that it was because the people repented. A closer example perhaps would be the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God was willing to compromise and not destroy the city, even if only 10 good people could be found in it. And an even closer example is from Numbers 14, where the Lord attempted to wipe out the Israelite nation when they rebelled at the borders of the Promised Land, but was deterred by Moses' pleading on the rebellious people's behalf. So God doesn't always, fortunately for us and for humankind, doesn't always carry out his threats. Secondly, there is metaphorical language here. Uh, one speaks of the beast worshippers drinking the wine of God's fury from the cup of wrath. One would think that such wine would be highly poisonous. Another speaks of torment with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Well, the end should be rapid for these rebels since it seems unlikely that the angels and our Lord would stand around the eternity watch, for eternity watching the show. The term torment does not carry inherent in it the notion of eternity. And thirdly, the scenario must be symbolic. At a physical level, burning sulfur has a faint blue flame and virtually no visible fumes are emitted for those of us who did chemistry back in high school. There has to be something else burning in there to cause smoke. This may sound a bit grisly, but in the case of humans, both smoke and the production of tormenting pain can only occur if human flesh was actually being burned. If this burning was taking place at or above the boiling point of sulfur at 400 degrees centigrade, the process would be virtually instantaneous. Once everything has been burned, the smoke disappears. There would actually have to be a miracle for the smoke of their burning to ascend forever and ever, unless what is really meant is that the puff of smoke that marks the end of the ungodly dissipates into the eternity of space. The precedent of smoke going up forever from a fire that does not burn forever is found in the Old Testament story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah referred to in Jude 7 as being an eternal fire, but it is clearly not still burning. Another reference is Isaiah 34, 7 to 15, which describes the destruction of the land of Eden by an eternal fire of sulphur that will not be quenched day or night and whose smoke rises forever. However, the rest of chapter 34 depicts animal and bird life returning to Eden, which could only happen if the fires had died out. The concept of fire that will not be quenched and smoke that rises forever are indicative of the severity of the fire rather than its longevity. And there are several examples of this use of the term in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these are the points I've been making. First, it's a warning. The tense is mostly future. God doesn't always carry out his threats of punishment. The language is metaphorical. <coughs> The scenario has got to be symbolic. And fourthly, uh, linguistically speaking, the Greek word translated forever doesn't actually mean eternity as we understand it, but for an age. The duration of the age is not specified. Now finally, verse 11b here in this chapter uh, 14 asserts that there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast. You remember we read that earlier in the year. And uh, yes, verse 11, those who worship the beast, uh, there is no rest day and night for those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That's what it says. Now, Orthodox theology uniformly attributes this restlessness to their eternal torment. But there are other more cogent possibilities. It could refer to the uncertainty of life in the satanic state set up by Satan and the beasts. It could refer to slave labor conditions. But you have to read these things in context. And the next verse, verse 12, throws into contrast the state of the wicked and the state of the saints who obey God's command and remain faithful to Jesus, who are called to patient endurance. They can exercise patient endurance in the face of persecution because they have a sure hope in the eventual victory of Almighty God over Satan, even in the face of death. The wicked have no such hope. That's why they'll be restless, because they've got nowhere to turn. They've been abandoned. <clears throat> Other arguments supportive of the conditionless view that hell is not a place 
of uh, eternal conscious torment, but a place where punishment for sin is rapid and complete, include the fact that none of the uses of the Hebrew word Sheol, often translated as hell, and sometimes as the grave or pit in, the, in our Bibles, are unequivocally used in the Old Testament to mean a place of eternal punishment. The word means a place of unconsciousness, inactivity, or sleep. Isaiah 66, uh, verse 24, is sometimes used as a, a clear description of eternal torment in hell, where it says, All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord, and they will look upon the bodies of those who rebelled against me. Their worm will not die, nor will their fire be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. But the bodies there described are actually dead ones. They're not living creatures. They're not living people. They're dead ones. The figure of unquenchable, unquenchable fire, as in Ezekiel 20 and Matthew 3 and 12, is used to denote a fire powerful enough to destroy anything consigned to it and unable to be snuffed out or quenched until it has destroyed whatever it fuels it. Whatever fuels it. it doesn't mean that the fire continues forever. Jesus' teaching on hell is that it is a place of punishment, but none of his seven references to Gehenna the Valley of Hinnom, which is outside the city of Jerusalem, a state that it is a place of eternal fiery torment. He spoke of the of fire, but not of eternal fiery punishment. Indeed, he warned people to be afraid of the one who has the power to destroy both body and soul in hell. Theologians have inferred that it is a place of eternal conscious torment because of Jesus' referral in one instance to their worm dying not, quoting Isaiah 66:24. But we've already shown that that reference is about dead bodies being eaten by worms. It is a very big jump to equate worms with human beings or human physical life, whatever Jesus meant to convey by this reference. Paul writes of the everlasting destruction, not the everlasting destroying of those who reject the gospel of Christ. Their destruction is complete and permanent. See also John 6, 3.16, which I've already quoted. It is reading too much into the text to equate the trouble and distress that Paul teaches will be the fate of those facing God's anger on the day of judgment with eternal conscious torment. So what are the other options? <clears throat> well, there's what's called the metaphorical view. And this is held by people like J.P. Morland, possibly C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham, and others. And to them, hell consists of eternal separation from God in some part of the universe. So they're sort of quarantined off. Hell exists, but the eternal punishment is not physical, but mental. It is the knowledge that they are permanently shut off from God. They have no hope. Keller sees hell's inhabitants as continuing their self-chosen rejection of God into infinity. Now, on the positive side, this view correctly interprets the pictures of hell in the Bible as metaphorical. Fire, darkness, lake, immortal maggots, summer, uh, sulfur, gnashing of teeth, etc. But on the negative side, this theory only replaces one type of terror, that's physical terror, with, a, with another, psychological terror. And you have to ask, which is worse? Then there's the universalist view. <clears throat> now this was first suggested by Oregon in the third century. In this view, hell is a temporary condition of graded punishments that eventually lead to repentance and salvation. In the end, all are saved. There is no need for eternal torment. It is unthinkable that a loving God would allow millions of people to suffer for eternity for sins committed over a finite lifetime. Essentially, universalists extend the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory to include the souls of all people, not just the faithful. Its exponents point to passages of scripture that seem to offer hope of universal salvation. I haven't listed them there, but I've got them in my script. Um, it is... Um, and... Um, in response, I would say that the passages quoted, quote, indicate the scope of God's salvation. It's universal in the sense that anyone can be saved, but they do not affirm that everyone will be saved. God respects the decision of those who reject his offer. So the concept of remedial punishment after death is not a biblical one. Rather, the destiny of each person is fixed at death. And so we return to the conditionalist or annihilation view. In this view, hell is real. But after the judgment, sinners suffer not the punishment of eternal torment, but eternal destruction. And this view is based on a number of scriptures, um, which I think I haven't got there. Anyway, the biblical, there are biblical verses that teach that death is the punishment for sin. 
And that at the final day of judgment, the wicked will suffer eternal destruction. The final destruction of the wicked is graphically described by Old Testament writers. So I've got about half a dozen references there. Jesus spoke often of the destruction of the wicked. And Paul used the same kind of language. Peter uses similar language. And this view does away with the anomaly that although Scripture teaches that there will be no more mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away, there would in fact be countless millions of people suffering eternal pain and torment if the traditional teaching on hell is correct. And so, um, this, is, this is what the conditionalist view uh, would look like, <coughs> where you've got death here, and the intermediate state, and in this state uh, the body lies where it is in the grave, uh, has got no, um, no awareness, but at the resurrection, which is over here, uh, here rather, right, in this diagram, God has records of us. He's got records of accountability. And he's got records of identity. And those records will enable him to resurrect us for the judgment. The righteous souls will go to heaven and the, uh, the unrighteous ones to hell and destruction. So in conclusion then, <coughs> Uh, I affirm, we affirm the doctrine of eternal punishment in hell. But we do not hold that the punishment is one of eternal conscious torment. I believe we have to accept that the critics are right and indeed join them in this uh, matter. But in doing so, we must not backpedal the righteousness and judgment of God, concepts to which modern people do not relate well. They want a God of love. But the biblical picture of God is that he is both a God of compassion and a God of purity, holiness, and righteousness. On the one hand, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and on the other, he is to be worshipped with reverence and awe because he is a consuming fire. The doctrine of God's final judgment is necessary to undergird human love and peacemaking. Without ultimate accountability, humans are free to live any way they want, including taking vengeance into their own hands. So the take-home message is this. While it is fascinating to explore this deep and complex doctrine of Holy Scripture, we must always remember that it is not just an interesting intellectual exercise. Hell is real, and many of our friends and family are going to end up there unless they acknowledge the Lordship of God and of His Christ. It would be wrong to end this study only with an intellectual sense of satisfaction that we are right and others wrong. It ought rather to be a reminder that we are the Lord's ambassadors who have the responsibility to pray for and witness to those in our circle who, whether they realise it or not, are in danger of missing out on God's gift of eternal salvation. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I guess we've got a few minutes. <coughs> if you've got some comments on that or you'd like to... Thank you very much for your Bible, sir. That was really helpful. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yes, I mean, there'll be some new ideas there for some of us. Um, some of us would have heard these things before. Um, George? Would you like to comment on some people believe there's a second chance? Some people? Believe that there's a second chance. And yes. Sometimes I interpret the word or yes. as being everybody. Yeah, there's a bit of controversy about that as well. Yeah, well there is, uh, uh, but the, the reason for the controversy is usually because of this doctrine of eternal torment um, in hell. And essentially the view you're talking about is actually a universalist view. Yeah. Whether, whether you believe in the end that God is going to save everybody, or whether they're going to get a second chance, it's a universalist view. It seems to me, and, and to others, I'm not, I'm not a total expert in that area, but it seems to us that, um, that that is not actually the meaning of, of what God's message is trying to get through to us. Um, there is one way to, to, uh, to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. And we don't hear about another way, really, from, from Jesus' own teaching. Yeah. David, um, thank you for the effort and the trouble you've gone to. Um, on, a, on the second slide that you showed... I think you, well, you might have been around the second side, you spoke of the moral justification for the 
or the view, the traditional view that there is yep. a team yep. of conscious clashing. But um, usually something like that that's quite right. Yeah. Um, I would argue that that's not a moral justification, but rather a logical uh, reasoning or, or, or justification. I think I believe the moral justification is that those who reject God are rejecting a perfect being, um, and therefore that, that's where the moral justification comes from. Right. Um, and I, I hold a different view to you. I, yep. I disagree sure. with you, but it's not a pillar of our faith, so that yep. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yep. But I would say that because because that's how you've set up your argument, that it's a bit of a straw man argument in that sense. Well, it, it, it depends where uh, to what, what you're attributing the, the moral. I'm talking about the morality of an argument that says that people are going to be tormented day and night in hell. Mm. And I think there is a, a, a moral element to that. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't agree with that. With that I, I'm, I'm coming back to the phrase that you used, sorry, I might be some misunderstanding. The phrase that you used was that the, the moral justification is based yeah. on the idea that the, the soul is immortal. Yeah. But I don't see that as a moral justification okay. at all. That, yeah. that, those two, I think, are totally yeah. different. Fine, I, I'd, I'd accept yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Um, but what would you say to the idea that because God is perfect, and because we are given every chance to receive him and accept his offer, um, and Romans even talks about creation, showing us there is yeah, God that's right. and, and there's no excuse. Yeah. What would you say to that argument, that the <coughs> idea that since we're rejecting a, moral, a, a perfect God and we've given, been given every opportunity, that there is some, even though we don't really have, necessarily have the answer as to why there might be eternal conscience, punishment, um, but that there is some justification in that sense, that, that there should be a term of punishment <coughs> for such a, such a rejection. So could you say, you know, just... Oh, uh, I, I, think, I think some yeah. people would say, and it, this wouldn't be my argument, yeah. but some, some people would say that because we've rejected a perfect yeah. God and we've had yes. every opportunity yeah. to receive him and there is absolutely no excuse for not receiving yes. him, and, and because of who he is and... Yes. and Everything else yes. that that justifies that eternal we're rejecting an eternal God, so yeah. an eternal punishment. Yes. To put it, probably yes. Yeah. yeah I, I, yes. I mean, I I had heard that argument, um, and um, I I just wouldn't agree with it. Mm. I, you know, I I think that God is a God of love, and um, it just seems to me that having people um, hanging around His creation, hanging around in eternal torment. He's not really sort of part of his character. I don't. I don't think that he would. He, he would want that. I don't think he would allow that. And um, um, I think that um, uh, if people, it's sort of coming back a bit to what George's question was about. If people reject Christ now, then um, it, there's no reason to think that they would actually accept him at some point later on. Mm. Um, there's just no logic in that, you know. It's, it's, well, I mean, here's this rich man in paradise sort of thing. So, you know, he's uh, he's there. He's not actually saying, "I did wrong. Please accept me back into heaven." Uh, he's sort of sitting where he is, and he's quite comfortable. So, yeah, I, I think that. Um, well, I don't know that he's comfortable. Perhaps he has a realization that there's, <laughs> yeah. there's no way out. Maybe. He obviously he obviously wasn't comfortable. But yeah, perhaps he knew he that he was there was uncomfortable, for eternity, but he, but he wasn't so screaming at the same was brothers he? instead. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't sort of being tormented. Yeah. I think the idea of a parable is sort of one idea. Yeah, and this question of what is that one idea? Yeah, it's not complicated. It's yeah. a simple yeah. story with yeah. one simple idea. There is a gulf between yeah. the two. Yes. Um, that's the first simple question. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I think that's right, but. Um, I th it seems to me the idea here is quite clearly that uh, that even if someone was to go to hell and, and, and pre preach to these people, they still wouldn't accept it. It's going back to the, mm -hmm. this issue of whether there's another chance or not. And uh, it seems to me um, that Abraham is right. He says that even if people go back there, they won't. They they, they make no difference in the end. People have made up their mind, and that's it. 
Yeah, but the, the argument for a, a second chance and the C.S. Lewis great divorce, the bus coming up from the grey English town in winter uh, with an opportunity for people to get off in heaven, um, is most appealing morally to a human yeah. moral oh, it is. Uh, not my friend here who says that everyone's been told and they know yeah. and they've, they've denied, but that the undoubtedly countless millions who have not genuinely had the opportunity yeah. to accept or reject yeah. the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and that's where the second chance yeah. is most appealing right. to a person like me yeah. that thinks, well, there is undoubtedly a grave injustice that the 12-year-old um, slaughtered by the Taliban in, in Afghanistan yeah. never been near a church uh, would go to hell. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I agree. And um, it seems to me that, you know, that that alone is the reason why one would have to have some doubts about an, an eternal conscious uh, torment in hell. Yeah, I think the best we can do really, and we're talking about those people who have not had an opportunity um, to, to learn about Christ, is A, that um, seems to me that they, that, that every every tribe, every nation has a some kind of a code of honour or someone that they follow, and to some extent, maybe God can use that as a way of determining whether it's they... It's appealing, but it's another way of saying there's an alternative gospel. Yeah, that's right. It's an alternative gospel, that's right, yeah. 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 But there is, you know, in Romans 2, it talks about the Gentiles having a light that's within them, yeah. which I think... Um, and also, too, in Athens, Paul speaking in Acts 16, where he says that God is closer than what you realise, and... Yeah. And which suggests that God can interact like He did with Cornelius and, and yeah. Peter on the roof. Yeah. You know that, that, that these people yeah. still have connection with God yeah. in their own way. And yeah. There's a sort of a grey area there. Of, yeah. We're not quite sure what's going on. Yeah, well, it's, it goes. It's, it's similar to Paul's and Paul's conversion. Isn't it? I mean, there was Paul who was totally rejecting Christ, and did Christ appear to him? Mm -hmm. um, sort of situation which we would love to see happening more often. And, and in fact, it does happen. I mean, that's, that's another interesting issue that, uh, particularly um, in, in Islamic nations, apparently thousands of people have visions of Christ, and many of them become Christians as a result of it. And, um, you know, that's, that, that's a fantastic thing happening out there that there are more Islamic people coming to the Lord at the present time than have been for many, many centuries. And, and many, much of it is due to God's revelation of himself um, by dreams and visions. Yeah. Some years ago I <coughs> came across this book uh, Facing Hell by John Wenham and uh, as a result of that I became a sort of believer in the condition of immortality which mm -hmm. does seem to fit God's character mm -hmm. and uh, get rid of this, uh, this idea of you know, uh, suffering going on forever and ever yeah. and also something you did touch on that um, if God's um, solution at the end is for there to be a perfect universe, then to have hell and people suffering in hell doesn't quite seem to fit in with that yes. idea of perfection. Yes, true. Yep. True. Conditional, uh, I mean, uh, I, one of the verses I like is, uh, I think mean, Peter talks about, uh, we, we become, when we accept salvation, that's at that point we became partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. And it's at that point that we, that our spirit, or whatever part of us, lives on. It's at that point that we become um, eternal. Mm. Maybe when it's when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells with us when we're converted. Yeah. Well, so, something clearly happens when that when that happens, and it seems to me that <coughs> that it's at that point. Um, that, uh, that that God recognizes that um, that our fate, long-term fate, will be different to other people. Um, it's, uh, it's conditional mortality says that um, uh, that when you accept Christ as your Savior, then you're in God's book of life. That seems to me. I, mean, I, I haven't done a study of this myself, but I'm aware that in the Scriptures there is a lot of 
uh, reference to God's book of life as being, seems to be a compendium of the names of people, identities of people who have become known to him, I guess through salvation. Uh, maybe in Old Testament ways, uh, in the Old Testament times by other ways, but, but that's a compendium that God has. I dare say he's got a computer now, but um, in those days it was a book. And, uh, and that, that's how God keeps track of us. Even though we might be scattered, it um, seems to me that if, uh, some, people, some people ask, you know, how could it be that a person who has been dead for a thousand years and whose body might be you know, scattered all over the earth, how could God recreate that person? Well, it just seems to me that if God did it once, he can do it again. And, um, so you don't have any problem with people being cremated? I, don't, I don't personally don't have any problem with it, no. But you couldn't really. I mean, <laughs> people before cremation, people, the, the Christian sailor who's lost at sea and gets yeah. eaten by the fish, I mean, there has to be yeah. a um, reconciliation, a resurrection involving something other than the restoration of yeah. these mortal yeah. remains. That's right. Yeah. I think the idea is that, you know, you've got these different views like there's duality, we're two parts, you know, spiritual and non spiritual, yeah. or we're three parts, which is more a Greek idea. Yeah. The Hebrew is the idea of unity, yes. which puts in more neuroscience and the fact that we are a unity. Yep, yeah, that's right. And, and there is a sense in which, you know, the body is resurrected and added to that body is something which yeah. God has programmed our DNA, if you like, yes. you know, somewhere yeah. or other. Sure. And that's just the way I sort of see it, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's helpful. But the scripture does point out body, soul, and spirit. You'll present body, soul, and spirit. Two interesting points. One is Ecclesiastes. It says, I've put eternity in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's before we're Christian or not Christian. Yeah. So it appears that everyone has eternity in their hearts. Yeah. The other important thing is to see, I think, is that as in Adam all die. We died in Rome, end of Romans 4, uh, end, of, end of Romans 5. Sin entered the world by one man and death by one man. We, we're judged not by what... We've got this kind of concept, we're judged by our sins. Yeah. Now, that's truth in that, but it's not all the truth. It's the sin principle. It's not what we do is a problem, it's what we are. Because yeah. what we do, the crop tree brings forth crop fruit. Yeah. The, the tree, the problem is the rootstock. So when, when we failed in Adam, we died there. Mm. So that leads then to ask, and I've just been searching myself, listen, to receive Jesus is not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible. It received past tenses once, but received. to accept Jesus is not in the Bible. To depend on our faith is no longer grace. If it depends on us to believe or accept or whatever, then we begin to enter into a very light area because of this whole question of, uh, of uh, well, you've just not even talked about it today, election, Predestination. I'm not saying we should go down that line, but I'm just saying that that uh, we go back to Adam. Mankind was lost as an Adam all died. Now, if you go to basically um, Noah and the flood, everyone was wiped out except for the eight people. And it's only by the grace of God that they found favour and grace and the light of God. So we've got an overarching thing here. We've got to. I think today we've got a misplaced emphasis on what we must do rather than seeing that all mankind are under the wrath of God. Yes. And it's only by the prevenient grace of God yeah. that anyone even is interested in God, yeah. even got a heart for God, even a desire for God. Yeah. And I, I think myself is, um, that there's a bigger picture here that we've misplaced an emphasis yeah. into something that's yeah. Got truth, but it's not all the truth. Yeah. Are you saying that we are sinners before we've done our first sins? Yes, definitely. The Bible clearly teaches yeah. that. We're not sinners because we, we're sinners because we're in Adam. We failed in Adam, yeah. and that's what Romans is all about. Romans is not all about, but it's very strong in Romans chapter five. Yeah. That sin entered the world by and death came by sin, not our sin, but his sin. Yeah. And so sin is, if you like, it's not strictly speaking, correct, but sin is what we are. Sins are what we do. The bitter spring of the water is bitter, not the not problem with the water, it's the spring. It's not the problem with the fruit that comes from the tree, it's the tree itself. So that could be quite helpful because people, so when you talk to people who are not believers, um, they say, well, I'm, I'm 
all this, all this various degrees of sin. Mm -hmm. So you need to point out, Patterson, it's not that which God is bothered about. It's because when you actually first came into being, yeah. something needed to be done because you weren't fit for God's presence when you first came into being. Because, as yes. we say, you were born in sin. Yeah, I think what, what, what Adam and Eve brought in was rebelling against God. It seems to me that that's where, that's where the bulk of the universe is at the moment, in rebellion against God. And that's really the basis of sin. And all the other things that we do, like stealing from the butcher's shop and all that kind of thing, those are sins. And it's not those things that God's so concerned about. It's the actual heart relationship of, of, um, uh, of receiving God and, uh, and accepting that, um, uh, that He is our Saviour. And that's why Ezekiel brings in a new heart will I give you. Yeah, that's oh, right. it's got to be changed. Heart. You can't patch yeah. up the old, you can't yeah. put new that's wine right. into old wine skins. Yeah. You see, it'll expand and explode. Yeah. So it's new heart stuff. And Ezekiel's very clear on that in two, two passages there. Yeah. And uh, that's why I think it's, it's this whole, and that what we had this morning in the sermon, of course, was imputation. We haven't even talked about that. But the key mechanism in Romans chapter 4 is that and in Psalm 32, uh, is the key verse in Psalm 32, blessed is a man and a woman to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Yes. That's the negative side. Right. In other words, sin, our sin has been charged to Christ's account in, in Romans 4, and uh, our Christ's righteousness has been charged to our account. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can see more into that dimension, we'll understand more of the grace of God that every man and woman is hell bound. It's only by the mercy of God that you'll rescue anyone from the torments of, you know. Yeah. And uh, because the scripture is clear, on, on many times, as an animal dies. Um, oh, that's what baptism is about. about, really, isn't it? Baptism is, is a symbolism of, of that old sinful self being left behind in the grave mm -hmm. and being, uh, being risen out of that baptism to, to new life in Christ and, and uh, the washing away of the old sins and that, that's what's needed, that new heart. That, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the symbol. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate what you had to say there. It's very mm. <laughs> encouraging. But uh, just to come back to the topic, um, the point you made that just struck me and I hadn't actually thought of it until you raised it was that there was no human death uh, prior to sin entering through Adam. So does that mean... Sorry, there was no human... There was no human death yes. prior to sin entering. So does yes, that mean right. we were created to be immortal? Yeah. Because no one would have died yeah. if it wasn't for sin entering through Adam. They needed the tree of life, though, didn't they? Um, so that um, I, I think even at the very beginning, um, and some of those people lived for immense, immense lengths of life, but there was a tree of life in the garden, and I presume it was there. That that would that it's was trip, somehow yeah. enable them to go on living. But I think death was more spiritual death though, rather than physical death. Sorry, I think the death was more spiritual death rather than physical death, because they still carried on living. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've sometimes wondered why. Yeah, why do we, Why do Christians have to go through but death straight away? Yeah. Why, why do Christians have to go through this physical death? It seems to me that one answer is that. Just as there are things in life which we do or say, which we are then, which subsequently we become profoundly, um, um, profoundly um, <coughs> sad about, um, we've created a situation or done something which was bad, and we can never go back and recover that. And there are consequences of everything that we do. It seems to me that death's a bit like that that um, it's, a, it's a consequence of that sin that, uh, that is shared, the original sin. And, uh, and it's something that, we, that can't be put right. It can only be put right when God puts it right at the resurrection. And uh, that's, that's my, my thoughts about it, for whatever they're worth. I, I felt your talk was very directed to human beings um, I felt you missed out the whole aspect of angels <coughs> who fall and there's no um, Christ to die for them and there's a reason you can get into all sorts of things along that track um, but because we've inherited a nature from Adam but the angels are created one by one 
specially created. So when they fall, wouldn't hell apply to them the same as human beings? Uh, I think well, Revelation makes it clear that it was yeah. created for them. Um, there are angels there, and I actually did list them as being part of the, of the, of the supernatural beings. Um, the, um, and they do have roles. Uh, Michael, the archangel, for example, is the leader of uh, God's army. And um, so they do have roles. I, I don't um, neglect them altogether. But um, we, <laughs> we're talking about hell, really, as it, as it applies to us today. And uh, one, we're not trying to cover the whole of Christian theology or dogmatics yeah. um, today, but yeah, I, I accept it. You know, we, certainly we have to give a place to angels and that they are God's ministering agents um, to us. And they, and they're good angels. They're probably bad angels as well. I mean, you know, Satan's probably got his own his own armies there of angels and. Um, um, they are directed against God. In fact, Paul says we're, we're, we're facing not just uh, human flesh and blood, but we're facing, uh, we're facing supernatural beings and, and um, in, in our warfare, in our, in our daily walk with God. It's not just um, natural things, but supernatural things that we're up against. And uh, so I think angels are very important. And I think um, uh, Satan is real, and I think Satan is working his best to destroy what God has created and to stop people from coming back to God and from repenting from their sins and and, uh, and receiving God's mm -hmm. salvation. I think all of those things are true. But we just don't have time to talk about them today. <laughs> okay. okay. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Dave. Good. Appreciate Thank you. it.